Well, hey everyone, welcome to Ground Soul Online. My name is Taylor and I am so glad that you were joining us today. I just have one thing to let you know about before we head into the rest of today's service. Um, the one thing I need to say is that May 14th at Ground Soul, at our Truro location, we are doing baptisms. And so if baptism is something that you wanna know more about, you're interested in, um, please reach out to us. There's a connect card in the description box below you can fill out and say you're interested in a conversation about baptism. Baptism is really just this um, symbolic act that they did all the way back when Jesus walked the earth. Um, so it's been around the church for a long time. And it's a symbolic act of getting dunked in water that symbolizes um, being dead and coming up into new life. And that new life is found in Jesus. And so if yeah, that is something that you've experienced, you've experienced new life in Jesus, that um, he's changed who you are, changed your life. Baptism is something that could be for you. So check out that connection card, fill it out if you want a conversation with us. And other than that, we just wanna encourage you to come. Put that on your calendar, May 14th. It's gonna be such a great Sunday to come in person. You won't wanna miss it. Um, it's gonna be a celebration. So we wanna encourage you, put that on your calendar, come celebrate Baptism Sunday with us. It's gonna be a Sunday that you won't wanna miss. So that's all for me. Um, let me pray for us today. Father God, we thank you for this day. I thank you for every person tuning in. Lord, would you speak to us? We give you this time, we give you this space. Would you speak to us now through this message, through um, some worship songs? Lord, would you speak to us? Would your presence um, just move through any screen, any device, um, be with any person who's here. We know that you are not limited by anything. You're not limited by an online screen. You're not limited um, by anything, Lord. So we just pray that your presence would be with every person watching and you would um, change us today, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. When I was a kid, my parents took us to a small Anglican church in our community. Now the inside looked a lot like our building did before we renovated it. Cinder, block, walls, stained glass windows, old wooden pews, and a, a red rug that ran straight down the center aisle. Now, my childlike understanding was that the upstairs was reserved for adults because that was where you had to be quiet. Like, you couldn't touch things, everyone had to be very serious, and you needed to know when you were supposed to stand up, when you were supposed to sit down, when you were supposed to kneel, which, as a kid, seemed very confusing to me. But the basement was where Sunday school happened. It was small with the, you know, the typical church basement smell, but those Sunday school teachers did everything they could to make it seem special to us. We sang songs, we played games, we learned Bible stories. At Christmas time, of course, we would put on the big church Christmas production with the kids all dressed up like wise men and shepherds and angels and doing the whole nativity scene thing. Nobody, no kid wanted to be stuck being one of the animals, of course, especially if it was the donkey costume or any other animal for that matter. But if you were an angel, it was like you got the, you got the prime job. Like your, your career was just about to start because you had this angel position. Like it was, everybody wanted to be an angel. But I actually learned a lot from those Sunday school days. Although maybe not the things that you may think. The women and men who taught me, they were beautiful people. They were kind and generous and gracious and joyful. They were good people who cared deeply. And they demonstrated what it looked like to be a good human being. Some of the moral values that are woven into the fabric of who I am today, I guarantee you came from those people. Now, on the other hand, some of the upstairs adults gave me a very different vibe. It seemed to me that you needed to dress a certain way, act a certain way. There were right answers and there were definitely wrong answers. And questions or doubting was certainly not welcome. Church was somewhere you went on Sunday morning. You sang the hymns, you read the prayers, stand up, sit down, kneel in all the right places, and then you just carry on with the rest of your week. 
At least that's what it seemed like to me as a child. Now, when I was around 12 or 13, we kind of mostly stopped going to church, at least my mom and my sisters and I did, um, except maybe for Christmas, Christmas Eve, as I, as I grew up, um, I, just, I just continued to develop opinions on the church, on church people, opinions about Christianity, even opinions about Jesus, based on the Christians that I had encountered in my life. And the older I got, the more I believed that most Christians must be in denial, with their heads stuck in the sand, or incredibly gullible to believe all that church stuff. That if they just quoted some hallmark type scripture verse and said, we just need to pray about it, that somehow they thought this messed up world around us would magically turn right side up. Or that all of the questions and doubts and disappointments that we deal with as humans should just be stuffed away in an imaginary drawer somewhere so that we can pretend they don't exist. We can just trust God. Maybe you had similar experiences. Now, I can only imagine what it was like for those first followers of Jesus, how they must have been treated. I'm going to guess probably in a really similar way, particularly right after Jesus was crucified. People must have thought they were crazy following that rogue rabbi, this teacher who constantly challenged the cultural norms, upsetting the religious and political leaders. This Jesus who taught about the kingdom of God where the last would be first, the oppressed would be free, the poor would be cared for. Why would they give up everything to follow someone like that? Sure, maybe there were a few healings and some unexplained fish and bread buffets for thousands of people, but this Messiah? the one they thought would save their people from the Romans, they killed him. People must have thought that the disciples were either really gullible or Jesus was a master at deception. But the truth is, the disciples who arrived at Jesus' tomb, who hid out in the upper room or walked away from Jesus altogether, they, they weren't in their heads, with, they weren't with their heads in the sand. They were realists. And they were dealing with the greatest disappointment of their lives. All of the hope that they had placed in Jesus had disappeared. And regardless of where you currently are in your faith journey, if you haven't already, I guarantee you will hit that crossroads too. That intersection of faith in God and the painful realities of the broken world that we live in. Mary Magdalene was one of the first to arrive at the tomb. And I can only imagine what she would have been feeling that day. Her sorrow, her grief, the pain of her loss. How could Jesus be gone? Is Jesus had transformed her life. And she thought for sure he was the one who was going to save the Israelite people. What about everything she had seen Jesus do? The, the miraculous events she had witnessed, the hope that she had been filled with for a new day, a better life. On that day, she had come to prepare the body as was their custom, and, and as she approached from a distance, she could see that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. And when she got there, his body was gone. I'm sure she assumed it was someone else. Like, it, it must have been the Romans. They must have done this. It says, she ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. 
Mary wasn't delusional in this moment. She wasn't gullible. She was logical and realistic. Jesus was dead. She knew he died. He was put in the tomb and death was final. So someone must have taken his body. That was the only possible logical solution in her mind. The other disciples, they were hiding out in an upper room, shaken by the events of the days before, afraid to step out in public, dealing with the reality that their rabbi was dead, executed for blasphemy. At first, following their rebellious leader was exciting, but now, now it looked like it could cost them their lives. And what about the past three years they had spent with Jesus? Was it all a hoax? Was he manipulating them somehow? How would they face their family and their friends? Two of those disciples, they had already, they were already making their way out of Jerusalem. They were headed for home. They were headed for a city of the city of Emmaus. And they wanted to put some distance between them and the journey that they were on with Jesus. They had set their sights on a, a new locale, one with less baggage, because they had put their hope in Jesus. They had experienced life in color and believed that it was possible, but it is so confusing for them because it, it turns out real life is actually filled with more pain than hope, more harsh realities and optimistic futures. So maybe the best thing to do is just make the most of whatever life you have. The disciples were realists. They were dealing with their disappointment and their pain. And maybe that resonates with you today. Life can be really hard. It can be full of struggle, disappointment, pain, unanswered questions, doubt. One day things can be fine, and the next one, out of nowhere, you're hit with an unexplainable tragedy. Or on the opposite side of the spectrum, maybe you struggle. Maybe struggle is all you've ever known. One challenge after another that never seems to let up. Prayers seemingly going unheard. God seems to be so distant. What then? The disciple's story was about to take a drastic turn, a turn that would change their lives forever, a turn that would result in the church that we know today. Because Jesus wasn't dead, and he started making supernatural appearances, first to Mary, then to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And, and by late on Sunday, almost all of the disciples had seen the risen Lord except for one. Over time, the disciple Thomas has inherited the nickname Doubting Thomas. And while Mary is freaking out and the Emmaus disciples are running back to Jerusalem and, and the disciples gathered in the room are shouting over top of each other with their excitement of seeing Jesus, Thomas is nowhere to be found. The passage says this, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, at first glance, it, it may seem like Thomas lacked faith, that he allowed doubt to creep in and cloud his judgment. But the truth is, Thomas had a lot of faith. Thomas, he was sold out to Jesus. In fact, 
at one point when the other disciples were trying to talk Jesus out of going into this town where they knew he would not be welcome, Thomas was one of the only ones willing to die with Jesus if that had to happen. He was ready to go anywhere with him, even if it would cost him his life. But what he wasn't ready for was the disappointment of a life without Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, his relationship with Thomas ended. Thomas believed Jesus. He gave him his heart and his hope, and that belief couldn't live beyond the grave unless Unless Jesus actually lived beyond the grave, just like the other disciples said, and that was more than Thomas could wrap his head around. He wanted proof before he handed his heart over to be burned again. Thomas got his reputation as a doubter primarily because of his reaction when the disciples told him that Jesus was alive. He simply insisted that he needed to see for himself. The implications of a risen Jesus were too great to take someone else's word for it. And he had allowed himself to hope, to believe, and right now, it was safer to go back to believing that life is just a wild accident. We're, we're all a little bit like Thomas, if we're honest. The pain of loss, confusion, crying out to God for healing or help only to be faced with disappointment when things don't go the way we wanted. It's easier not to believe, not to hope. So why wasn't Thomas in the room when Jesus appeared to the other disciples? Where was he? Now, our gut reaction to doubt, our gut reaction or response to disappointment is to withdraw. When our soul is overwhelmed, we tend to turn inward, not outward. We isolate ourselves because doubt makes the community of belief pretty much intolerable to us. Doubt can create the feeling of being on the outside, like no one understands or relates, and, and we make assumptions pushing people away to protect ourselves because distance dehumanizes them. It's easier to dismiss someone if, if you don't have to look them in the eye. Where was Thomas when Jesus showed up? I imagine he needed some space. I imagine he wanted to be alone for a while to sort things out for himself. He wanted to be without the influence of others so he could decide for himself what was true, what his truth was. Here's the other thing about doubt. Agreement is affirming. So we tend to surround ourselves with people who think the same way we do, who have the same doubts or the same disappointments. We like to commiserate together. And when our community stops being a source of agreement, we go looking for somewhere else. And in times of doubt, we want to find people who will agree with us, agree with our doubts and affirm our version of skepticism. This is the current story of the polarized culture that we live in. We cluster together with people who affirm our position and we dehumanize those who have a different viewpoint, leaving no room for conversation. There's, like, there's just no space for that. Building community around our doubt always feels comforting at first because everyone's on the same page, but it's isolating in the end. It can feel good to find people who feel the same way you do, but ultimately what they are doing is giving us permission to stay in that place, to stop searching for answers, to just accept and change the subject. Community that affirms you without challenging you will make you feel comfortable, maybe even heard. 
but it will never help you grow. It won't help you heal. It won't stretch you to love those you disagree with or to have relationships that are filled with grace. I would argue that one of the bravest things that Thomas did was to go back into that room, to step back into community, to enter back in, bringing his doubts, bringing his disappointment with him, not denying his experiences, but sharing them with others. For, for some reason, we think that doubt is, is bad. Like real Christians don't doubt. But that's just simply not true. Doubt is actually the starting point of faith. In the New Testament, so the smaller section of the Bible, in that New Testament's original language of Greek, the meaning of doubter is inquirer. An inquirer is someone inquiring, asking, or hunting for answers. Sure, there are dishonest doubts people use to distract others from trusting Jesus, but there are also honest questions that we have about faith. Doubt is natural. It's okay to be honest about your doubts. And if you're truly looking for answers, your doubts will be replaced by faith when Jesus shows you the truth, when he shows up in the middle of your doubt. The passage continues. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. This sounds familiar to, for, from last week. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And then Thomas has this most incredible response. He doesn't stick his fingers in the holes. He says, my Lord and my God. Jesus met Thomas right where he was. Just as he met the women at the tomb in their grief, the travelers on the road to Emmaus in their confusion, the disciples hiding out in their fear, Jesus meets Thomas right in the middle of his doubt. Jesus honored Thomas's honest doubt. And when he visited Thomas in person to offer proof, Thomas responded with the ultimate statement of faith, my Lord and my God. We all have doubts from time to time. That's a normal part of living this life of faith. And what Jesus longs for in this post-resurrection encounter with Thomas is that we, like him, might believe in him by handing over our hearts and our hopes again and placing our trust in him. That's what living an Easter life is all about. That's what Thomas wanted. He just needed to see it, touch it, experience it before he was willing to risk that relationship again. Thomas's questions led to faith because he expressed them sincerely and truly looked for answers. He stepped back into community and looked for those answers. And the last mention of him in the Bible shows Thomas not questioning, but praying and waiting with the other disciples for the Holy Spirit to come. How did Thomas go from doubting to faith-filled? Well, the first thing he did was he was honest about his doubts. He laid them out there. And then secondly, he walked back into community. He didn't continue to isolate himself. He didn't continue to just stay in his, his fishbowl and, and just continue to talk about and think about all the doubts that he had. He stepped back into community where other people could speak into his life, where others who had experienced something different could maybe give him a glimmer of hope for his future where other people could walk alongside of him in his doubt and, and be a comfort and a strength to him. 
He walked back into community and you know what happened there in community? As the disciples gathered again in a, in a locked room, Jesus met Thomas where he was. He met him exactly where he was at. He met him in his doubt and his disappointment and his questions. He met him there because Thomas was earnestly seeking the answer. Now, I don't know where you might be today. I'm not sure which one of these characters that we've talked about over the last few weeks maybe might really resonate with you. But if you find yourself in a place of doubt, there's nothing wrong with doubt. Doubt can lead to faith in a really powerful way. That's what happened in Thomas's life. It completely changed the trajectory of his life in a very moment. And I believe that Jesus can do the same thing for you if we approach him, honestly seeking, honestly bringing our questions, honestly in our doubt. If we approach community in that way, where we just bring everything that we're carrying and we're honest and open about that. Jesus can work in the most powerful ways in the midst of our honesty, whether that's doubt or disappointment or pain or fear or grief, whatever it is, he can work in the midst of it if we approach him authentically and honestly. And so as we Get, we're getting close to the end of this series. Jeremy's going to bring another message next week. But as we kind of get closer to the end of this series, my question for you today is, is there an area of your life that you've actually stepped back? You've withdrawn, you've isolated yourself and you're, you haven't opened it up. You're not being honest with Jesus about your doubts and your questions and your disappointments that you've been holding it all in, that you're actually really frustrated with him, you're holding it all in and you've just never opened it up to him. I believe that he wants to step into that space with you today. He wants to step into the midst of your doubt just like he did for Thomas. But what he requires of us is to be open, to just bring them to, to, to yell and to share and to just really take whatever is inside of us, the frustration, the doubt, the, the struggle, and just like tell him, lay it out there for him because he wants to be in the midst of it with you. He wants to show you that he is who he says he is. And he, he wants to step into the midst of it and begin to, to work that out with you. The disciples were changed forever because Jesus showed them that he was exactly who he always said he was and that he had power over death and sin and the grave and that in him we could find new life. And so if you resonate with Thomas today, if you are stuck in your doubt, today Jesus is offering you new life. And all you need to do is be open to him. Let's pray together. Lord, we are thankful um, to see in the disciples ourselves, to see their grief and their confusion and their fear and their frustrations and their doubts that we can see ourselves there. And Lord, we can see that in each one of these situations, you met them exactly where they were. And so Lord, today I pray that for every person who is watching this, I pray God that you would meet them there today. You would come and you would be among them. You would be in their midst, whether it's doubt or confusion or pain that the Lord each and every one of us would open up our hearts to you and express our frustration express our doubts express our confusion and be expectant that you will show up in the midst of it so Lord I pray over every person watching 
that right now in this moment, that expectancy would rise up in them, that they would be expectant, that you will show up, that you will prove yourself to be who you say you are, and that maybe on this day, their life would begin to change forever. And I pray all these things in the strong and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Speak to me. You're the only voice I want to hear. Walk with me. Show Thank you for being with us for Groundswell Online today. It has been my pleasure to be with you. I hope you're having a great day. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you again soon.